Hey everybody, I'm Faith, and I have Down syndrome. But our podcast is not really about that exactly. And I'm Andrea. I'm friends with Faith. Our podcast is about conversations and connections. It's about how we are the same and how we are different. For each episode, Faith and I interview a different guest. Some of our guests experience intellectual and developmental disabilities, also known as IDD, and some don't. We talk about friendship, family, adulthood, and when it comes up, disability. Our podcast is called Everybody In because we are so interested in everybody. So let's get started. Hey, everyone. I'm Andrea Moore, one of your hosts for Everybody In, a podcast conceived and produced by the Wayfaring Band. And as George Michael always said, you got to have faith. So we do. She's sitting right next to me. Yep, that's me. And I am Faith Bedrain. I am Andrea's co-host. So everyone, welcome. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. So we've got a great show today. Uh, Who's our guest today, Faith? Our guest is our friend. I known her for a long time. We traveled together. So Mackenzie, Mackenzie, Mackenzie Bove Nickel. We are thrilled to have our good friend here with us in the studio today. Uh, now, so I'm going to take the lead on this one today, Faith, and I'll ask Mackenzie sort of a, a selection of questions about life, love, the pursuit of happiness little bit about disability um, and just a little bit about her background and get to know her better. Uh, so if that sounds good to you, should we get started? And you mentioned I can just do a follow-up question. Oh right? yeah. Anytime that you have a follow-up question or you want to phrase something a different way, you just jump right in. Okay. Sounds good. Well, let's do this. Let's do it. Awesome. Well, Mackenzie, we would like to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. We're delighted. Um, so, Mackenzie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, how old you are, you know, where you live, any recent updates? What's going on with you? Um, my name is Mackenzie. Um, I'm 23 years old. I'm currently a student at Metro taking photography, and I work at an after-school program. Right on. I forgot. There's actually a lot of life updates going on with you. I'm excited to hear more. Um Okay, well, welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, let's just jump right in, and then hopefully in our conversation we'll get down to it and get a chance to like hear more about some of those life updates that are going on with you. So we always start by asking our guests, who is your best friend, and why is that person special? Um, I don't really have best friends. I have multiple best friends in different types of moods that I'm in. Um. But uh, I would say my best friend is my dog. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Lucky Mickey. He's adorable. Tell us why Mickey is so special. Uh, why Mickey is so special. Um, he is my service dog. Um, so he helps me um, go places and is very more comfortable in awkward situations. Can you give us an example of some times that Mickey has really come in handy? Um, I don't do really good in crowds. I get pretty um, uncomfortable or in small places. Um, She's making <laughs> eyes at us because <laughs> this sound booth that we're in right now is so small. It's like 25 square feet, maybe. I mean, and there's three of us in here. We first got got here and we were like, Mackenzie, here's a sound booth. And she looked at it and she was like, uh, no, <laughs> like you can do it. You can do it. At least it's not loud or crowded. I mean, it's no, crowded. But. It's all good. Um. So he helps me with that stuff, and he kind of helps me communicate with people because I have sometimes I have trouble communicating with people. Tell us a little more about that, if you don't mind, because I don't people who aren't familiar with service dogs might want more information about what do you mean communicate. So I have autism, and sometimes it's hard for me to start conversations. So if Mickey's right there, there's because everybody likes dogs, you know. So. Um, <laughs> I feel like, so if I have Mickey with me, I will be able to communicate better with people and start conversations. Cool. What kind of dog is Mickey? 
Uh, Mickey is a blue healer mix. Nice. Yeah, he's adorbs. Yeah, um, he is a good dog. You are a lucky lady to have a nice, good dog like that. Um, what does it mean to you, like when you think about having a best friend? And I think Mickey is the perfect candidate. Um, I mean, people always say that about dogs, anyway, right? What? Uh, yeah, what is it about, what does that mean, like friendship, like best friendship like that? What do you get from Mickey that you're maybe not getting from some of your human relationships? Um, I I feel like when he, when I'm like sad or something, he doesn't really tell anybody that how I'm feeling, so it just stays with him. He's like a really good listener, so if I'm like mm. having a really bad day or just you know just not having a okay day i feel like i can just talk to mickey and he just responds to me and like comes up to me and just comforts me if i'm like sad or mad well not mad because sometimes he runs away but <laughs> <laughs> but um like when i'm just not feeling myself i feel like he is the one that could just bring me back down to earth cool while we're on the topic of service dogs are there any tips or things that you want people out in the world to know about how to interact with someone who maybe has a service dog um i would just you know ask him can i pet him because for mickey he's a service dog for me to interact with people so you can come up and say can i pet him and i will say yes but sometimes other service dogs or people that have service dogs don't want you to touch or pet their dog but for me, I changed that rule because okay. um, it helps me to communicate with my friends. Gotcha. So is it safe to assume that people should just ask? Yeah. That it could always be different, different cases? Yeah. Awesome. That's cool. And Faith, have you ever interacted with a service dog before? Well, I haven't. Um, but I know like one of the rules are is like you can't, you can't touch or pet them while they're working. But I was going to ask, um, see, if like when do they not be so busy of being the service dog? Mm. Uh, so for Mickey, um, I his break is like when I don't want to handle him. So like he'll get his days off like on the weekend. Sometimes I just let him just be a normal dog and just have fun because. If you're working all the time and you're not having fun or you're just tired of working, I feel like you'll lose interest in that. So I give Mickey like the weekends off sometimes. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, like all of us, right? We kind of. So need a when break. if he <laughs> if he does um, get like a day off, it's OK for people to pet him. Right? Yes. OK. But in general, if you see a dog that has the service jacket on. Yeah, it right. should and say, I see that all the time too. Okay, so. it should say "do not pet," but I took that off for yourself, for myself. But for most people, it and either way, you should touch. ask. Yeah, right. As you don't long as they dog. ask, because even though it's you might take it off sometimes, there might be other times when you're like, actually, don't touch, don't I, touch. <laughs> I I do that sometimes too, because sometimes I get very overwhelmed. I just cannot, you know, handle it. So if somebody says, "Can I pet him?" I just say, "No, sorry, he's working." Yeah. Nice. Well, cool. That was a neat answer to hear somebody say their dog. That's awesome. Um, okay. Now you've had this question before, but I'm going to ask you again, and I know what this is going to bring up and I'm going to try to just stay <laughs> calm. Mackenzie, if you could be an animal other than a human, what animal would you be and why? Um, I have two. Okay. So, <laughs> so you don't have to get scared. Um, my first animal would be a sloth. <laughs> breathe. <laughs> breathe. I'm breathing. I'm afraid breathe of sloths. Andrea. I don't like sloths and everybody knows it. Okay, go on. Um, and my second animal would probably be like a a hyper f hyper type of animal. I don't know. <laughs> um, cuz I'm always on the go too. So Oh, interesting. Um, so one part of you is like a sloth, but the other part of you is hyper. Yeah. Okay. Want to go places, but tell I us why. Been. Yeah. Cool. Why about the sloth? Why? Um, because I'm super mellow, and sloths are mellow 
because they all they do is sleep i don't like i love sleeping if i could i would be sleeping like all the time but that's not good um but um i just really think sloths are really cool and they're just super lazy and i feel like you need a day to be lazy sometimes you know so you don't have to do anything yeah just chill well, I'm I'm not going to let you get off the hook without me telling a couple of the <laughs> stories of what you've done to me over the years. Okay. Um, you know, Mackenzie sounds chill, but she's also maniacal and a dangerous sociopath. <laughs> and let me explain why. So I it is no secret that I do not like sloths. I don't like how slow they are. I find them to be very creepy. And Mackenzie knows this. And it's been a really a big point of contention for a long time. But it really culminated a couple months ago when I got back from a trip and, you know, we travel a lot in the Wayfaring Band. So I got back from a trip and I opened my office door <laughs> and Mackenzie, why don't you tell our listeners what, what I walked into, what you did to me? Go ahead. Tell them. She's laughing too hard to speak. Go ahead. Oh, tell them. So, um, Andrea, I believe was in Mexico or something or doing a wedding and, I um came to her office and she wasn't here and <laughs> <laughs> I decided to decorate her office with sloths oh, and no. I had a really I have a really big sloth pink sloth stuffed animal it's like jumbo size yeah like when she says jumbo size I want you to imagine <laughs> like bigger than a small child like four and a half feet tall gigantic pink sloth and where did you put it Mackenzie I just set it on your couch oh um, no no that was in my office oh chair. that was in your chair <laughs> I was um, sitting at my desk you had a oh, giant yeah. pink sloth sl- um, sitting at my desk yeah. go and on and then the I have like a costume head of a sloth too um <laughs> so you just put it on your head and you become a sloth a gentle creature um <laughs> and then I printed out like about 20 25 pictures of a sloth just hanging upside down and uh, mm-hmm. I had some stuffed animals I put in there mm-hmm. yeah and she I came back I have a small office yeah. and it was completely we're inventing a new verb now but I think it's warranted it was completely slothed <laughs> yes. by Mackenzie <laughs> you have I walked been in sloth. I w- <laughs> that's what it said did you on- scream I screamed I screamed I also was just so shocked I could I was just like <laughs> wait I didn't I had to like understand what I was looking at because it was picture a sloth sitting at your own desk in your own chair <laughs> then there were like three other sloth like different sloth stuffed animals around the office and then no joke like 25 printouts of sloths taped <laughs> on every surface <laughs> high and low <laughs> and then written in, in her scary sociopath handwriting <laughs> on the sloth taped to its chest it said you have been sloth (laughs) i have to say i was like oh so this is not a game anymore i see this is you know Mackenzie is not to be trifled with so if anyone out there is thinking about messing with Mackenzie, i would say think twice okay so that's because they're chill though except for when they become you know not chill of taking over offices um but so you feel like there's two parts of you there's this part of you that's chill and then this part of you that's athletic yeah yeah uh, athletic Maybe a cheater or something that's pretty fast and likes to be on the go. Um, I'm very athletic as well, so I yeah. Need tell to, us a little bit about that connection for you. Um, so I am, I'm a special. I play Special Olympics, and Special Olympics is like the Olympics, but with people that have disabilities and IDD and all different types of stuff. And you can just be normal too. Well, actually, it's no really way of being normal, but just typical. Yeah, we're like normal doesn't really describe yeah. anybody we know. Um, so it's like you're you don't you're not in special ed, I guess that's. So if uh, you're neurotypical, yeah, no, maybe t- yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you can that would be like a partner situation. So that would be like a unified, um, sport. So you would have partners and uh people that have a disability working together and coming as a community. Nice. Um, okay, and so just to kind of clarify some of those pieces, because you've been involved with Special Olympics for a long time, Yeah, right? about, I would say, 15, 16 years. Yeah, and it's a global organization. Um, I don't know the running number, although I know they do. They could tell you of how many countries globally are involved, but 
you almost know that you're supposed to. Now she's mad because she's like, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm supposed to know that number. (laughs) Sorry, Mindy. (laughs) (laughs) She's apologizing to the executive director of Colorado Special Olympics. Sorry, Mindy. Um, But a lot. There's a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, In 2015, the Wayfaring Band went to the Special Olympic World Games, which was in Los Angeles that year. Next year, it's going to be Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi, baby. Um, I know. It's on my mind. It's on my mind. I'm not ruling it out. But um, so when you're talking about like unified and things like that, so globally there's this massive organization, but then it's broken down into regions. And so like, and so we have a Colorado region state. Okay. Colorado Colorado region. region. And so they have an annual state special Olympic Mm -hmm. games, but what are the sports that you're involved with? Oh man, I'm in a lot of them. Um, so I play soccer, basketball, I snowboard, volleyball, softball, track, um, I feel like I'm forgetting some other sports. <laughs> um, but my two main sports is soccer and basketball, and I guess my third one is snowboarding. Right on, nice. Yeah, definitely not sloth when you're an athlete. <laughs> no, you wouldn't get much done if you were a sloth <laughs> when you were trying to play soccer. <laughs> yeah. so not to mention those claws would really pop the ball. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> what do you want to know, Faith? Well, I I just want to mention what kind of sports do you play with Connor? Because I know he's part of the special. Olympics as well. So Connor Faith's fiance. Oh yeah. Um I think I it's been a long time. Um I did play soccer with him with our first unified team with uh the Colorado Rapids like 2014-ish or 13. I don't remember. And I think I played tennis with him too, but I'm not I don't really remember. Nice. I and I know he's also Playing basketball. Do, do you play basketball? I do, but him? I'm not in his group. Team. Okay. Nice. All right. Well, let's move on. This is actually a good segue. Our, our next question, um, we usually like to ask a little bit about disability. And you already mentioned that you experience autism. Can you tell us a little bit more about what does that mean to you? Like, what does is, what is having a disability mean? Since it's different for everyone, what does it mean for you? Um what disability means to me um i've oh that's a hard question um i think for me um i can just be myself so i don't have to always act a certain way because i have a community that has the same well not the same disability but like on the same level as me so i can kind of fit in in that scenario um the other one is um the other question well it's all part of that same one i guess i just want to talk yeah about so yeah that you're saying that you feel like by identifying as a woman with a disability that to some degree it makes you feel like you fit in Mm -hmm. is that always true or are there ways in which it makes you feel like you don't fit in too um the work situation um for me it's hard to communicate so when i'm working i have to slow down and just see the bigger picture i guess and how i see what i should be doing um because i work with people that don't have disabilities so it's kind of hard to communicate what i need from them and what they need from me can you give me an an example of any time at work when it's been hard like when it like that they've expected you to do something that was hard for you to do um or when you needed something from them that they didn't give you right away so i guess cr- clarification is the big thing for me um just i need to know what we're doing like in order um so they didn't get like why why i didn't do it a certain way as they told me to do it Mm -hmm. because i felt like they need i needed to be it needed to be in um sections i guess or to break it down yeah break it down so i could understand and so the kids could understand too so just to clarify so were you asked to do a job that you feel like it was like too much information at one time yeah and so it would have been more helpful had they broken it down into smaller chunks yeah okay and i saw faith kind of nodding her head were you relating to what Mackenzie was saying about work yeah 
tell us a little bit about what you're <clears throat> thinking about when you hear her talk about that. Well, I totally um, understand because I I have a hard time too sometimes. Um, like I always need to break it down of some words. Um, and for like, like when we do the intro of this podcast, um, I know you and I were, you know, you were asking questions and it was, and it's a lot easier for me. Yeah. So you're talking about when we practice the podcast <clears throat> in the early versions, we used to have it all written down, but that was kind of so the, harder. The, yeah. Cause uh-huh. that, that was hard for me to, you know, cause sometimes it was hard for me of memory right. sometimes if you had to memorize exactly what to say yes and yeah. so for asking questions is a lot easier because then you can just be yourself and answer the question exactly right so what are some things that people can do so this- i can relate to me can see so yeah and this is a question for both of you i mean what are some things that employers can do to make it easier for and of, of course everyone with a disability is different but you know, what are some things that would make it easier for different type of people to do jobs? You can go first, we can <laughs> um, Like, do you me, have any suggestions? For, for me, employers? just be patient. Don't, like, always assume that we're going to not do it. We're going to do it, but we have to be on our own pace. Or be clear of what you're saying to do so we can achieve that goal. And this don't put us down as oh you can't do that let me just take that away from you and let me just do it to just get it over with mm-hmm. so somebody does your job for you yeah okay instead of giving you room to do it yourself yeah how does it feel when that happens uh for me i feel like well i guess i shouldn't work here then if you're just gonna do it for me because they're taking over your job mm-hmm. and then they tell your boss that you don't do anything. I just I never had this happen, but I see some of my friends that have a disability and they have issues with people just doing it for them mm-hmm. and then they get in trouble or they get fired mm-hmm. because they're not doing their job well, right. So tell us about when you're working. So you work as part of an after school program. Yes. So you're responsible for keeping little kids safe. Yes. Right? And, and having fun. And yeah. having fun. Um, have you ever struggled with people feeling like because you had a disability, you wouldn't be good at that or you wouldn't be able to do that? No, actually, I never had that situation. Um, so how I got into um, I'm a, a instructor for Denver Parks and Rec. So um, like 15 years ago, um, I started volunteering. I had a. When you were eight? No. How no, old were you when you I started? Was 15. I oh, when you were 15, yeah. you started volunteering. So that yeah. would be eight years ago. Yes, eight yeah. years ago. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> I was like, skills. you were I mean, eight. <laughs> sometimes you can volunteer yeah. when you're eight. Um, okay. No, I think I was 15. I freshman in high school. Okay. Um, And I had a. F- she was like an intern for Adaptive Rec. So adap- Adaptive Rec is like. Re- recreation for people that have disabilities so she was an intern at the time and then she got a job for community rec and community rec is just for everybody just to have fun i'm guessing what that because it says community in it <laughs> yeah. um and she said this will be a, probably a really good opportunity for me to uh, volunteer and so how i got into there i volunteered with congress park for summers in the parks and uh, the next year they wanted to hire me because I was so good with the kids and super chill and, you know, sloth mode. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Sloth um, mode, but cheetah is hiding inside yes. just in case a kid breaks away and runs. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Um, and so that's how I got into my job, what I do now. Um, so I don't, I didn't have like that, like, they already knew that I had a disability in some ways. So that was good. Um, the other thing is, like, I was working at a park, like, two years ago, and I did not fit in with any of the other instructors because they always wanted to take role, like, take 
the bigger they wanted to be the bigger person in all the situations and um I didn't really like that Mm -hmm. um so I just left it alone and just did me and just focused on my group of kids and um because I didn't want to deal with all of that drama and stuff so Uh, and do you feel like you've grown in your ability to do your job over these yes. years? Um, so I was instructor, instructor assistant for all these years. And this year they just uh, promoted me to be a regular instructor. So that means that I do planning and I um, have my own group. So I teach a group. Cool. Yeah. Um, I also want to just talk a little bit about disability as it relates to being a student. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your program that you're in? Yes, I am in IHECP Higher Intensive Education Certificate Program at Metro. And so what this means is this program does like helps you with college prep. So college prep classes is they teach you how to study, how to learn in a college level class. So it's not like high school anymore, like, you know, teachers do it for you or anything. They show you how to do it by yourself and how to read at college level, how to study, how to take tests and quizzes and exams and all of that stuff. But for me, um I I was too I, w- I felt a little higher in that education, so I really didn't need the help of s- like go like studying. Well, yeah, studying. Um I don't know. Um I was higher in the education that they were providing for me. So meaning that they were willing to give you more help than you needed? Yeah. Uh, so other students in that program maybe needed needed support that you didn't need? Yeah. Okay. And so I'm still in that program, but I'm a hybrid. So a hybrid is like um, I get support. I have just one class that's learning how to learn, and this is really helpful for me. It's, so it's like... They're teaching you how to work in groups because, you know, in college you work in groups sometimes, group work, um, writing papers um, in APA format Mm -hmm. stuff. (laughs) Um, So that's what I'm learning right now. And I'm taking two credit classes, um, a photography class and a fitness class. Right on. That's awesome. Uh, What is it like being on campus? Do you feel like you know how to get the support that you need i mean is it all coming through iagcp the supports that you need for for being having a disability yes um it's i do have the support i'm i'm pretty independent anyways so just knowing that i have support on campus and if i need anything they're right there and they could help nice awesome faith do you have a question (laughs) well I know we're talking about disability, um, and I know you say you work with kids, right? Correct. But how about, so if you have a disability, do you work with kids with a disability? Yes, we have, we, it's, it's yes and no. Um, In the summertime, we do, summer times, we do have kids with disabilities. In school, we do sometimes, but I don't think this year we have any kids with disabilities. Okay. And I know you mentioned about working, um, but I know you're also on the board of the directors of the Wayfaring Beam, right? Yes, I am. So what do you do for that? For being a director? Yes. Um, I just keep Andrea on her toes and just keep (laughs) her going, you know? (laughs) Don't let her back down. (laughs) Right. And what do you do between you and Connor? I... We're basically on the same level we just listen in and um for the travel the band members we um you know look at how it's going for the people with disabilities on going on a trip and how we can make it better or how we can make it funner or whatever yeah like so the board is made up of different people who have different connections to the band and Mackenzie and Connor are both also band members, right? Travelers. And so I do, I do think you and Connor both bring that perspective of thinking about like from an insider perspective of what it's like to actually go on a trip. So, li- so they just listen in, right? Well, no, they, they are full members of the board. So, I mean, you vote, mm-hmm. you 
you listen Green. they review all the financials Ooh. they approve the budget every year so we have to you know every year we plan a budget for the next year so like this fall they'll um we'll start talking about 2019 and the money for 2019 and so they they look at financial statements um they i mean they're the board of directors for a nonprofit. So it's interesting because like I'm the executive director of our nonprofit, but I actually serve at the pleasure of the board of directors. So that's how nonprofits work. Unlike a business where if you're the big boss of a business, then you are the owner and, and you can make all the rules. Once you become a nonprofit, the board actually makes all the rules. And so the employees are there to help the board with the governance. Um, so technically, Mackenzie and Connor could fire me at any time. <laughs> so that's why I have to stay on my toes. <laughs> um, Is but that including we for bringing new ideas for the trip for next year? Yes, we're going to have a meeting about that. Um, but yeah, that's something that they would help with is give new ideas. But also the rest of you, I mean, Faith, like you as an employee would also get to give new ideas and also just our friends get to give ideas. And then we kind of discuss all of that. Um. I want to go back to, I want to ask Mackenzie a question about becoming an adult. So you're 23. Yes. I want to know, have you had a, has it been a process for you in terms of self-acceptance around your disability? Like what has been your process or your journey from being a young person who's just trying to understand her brain and her body, right? And figure like now you're really good at talking about what you need. You know, you're really good at saying like, I don't like crowds and Mickey, my service dog helps me here. And, and I can be more successful in this way. And I need help with this. Were you always able to do that? Or has it been a process? Um, no, I was actually pretty quiet. Um, <laughs> I, d I let my mom do all of the talking, even though like sometimes I didn't agree with her, but I didn't want to like, I just let her advocate for me um but now it's 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 good in some ways and um hard in a different way too um because you still feel like you want to be a kid and you want your mom to do everything for you but then you look at your other friends or other people that are struggling and they don't know how to do it and I know how to because I have all of these supports in my life that if I need anything or if I have a question, I can go to someone that knows the answer. Um, it, um, yeah. And in case there's some younger people listening or parents of younger children listening who maybe also experience autism, can you tell us a little bit about what it used to feel like when you were younger before you had some of these tools? Yeah. So when I was younger, I used to hit, spit, kick, um, all of the danger or behaviors that were not okay. Um, I would just say to the parents, you know, listen to what your kid needs and don't give up on them because if you give up on them, they're, they're, they're just, they're not, gonna be successful in life um and for people for autism um out there just you know do you be brave step out of your comfort zone because i i usually i used to not get out of my comfort zone the last couple of years i have um because it was this time for me to grow up and, and venture out and not always rely on your parents to help you out because they're not going to be there all the time for you mm -hmm. so um and you know if you're struggling and you just can't do it you always have people around you that you know that are close and you trust so just go to them and i guarantee you they will help you out hmm. nice well, this is a good time to take a little break. And then when we get back after the break, I want to pick that back up and talk a little bit more about parents and about independence. But can we take a short break? Yeah. All right. We'll be back. The Wayfaring Band is not a rock and roll band, are we, Faith? Mm -mm. So what type of band are we? 
We are a band of travelers. Travelers, right. So the Wayfaring Band takes original, transformative adventures that include adults with and without cognitive and developmental disabilities. But anybody can come on a trip with us, right, Faith? Yes. Like who? Everybody. Like everybody. Yeah. Well, as long as they're a grown-up. Yes. They have to be a grown-up because we work with adults. Well, an adult everybody. An adult everybody. So if you're an adult everybody, you're welcome to join the Wayfaring Band on tour. If you're a caregiver, a student, a teacher, a professional, an activist, an interested adult everybody community member, all of you are welcome to join the Wayfaring Band on tour and experience our culture of inclusion firsthand. Be a part of it. How can they learn more, Faith? Learn more at www.thewayframeband.com. All right, welcome back from the break. Uh, Faith and I are here with our guest, Mackenzie Bove Nickel, and we've got just a few more questions in store. Um, so, right before the break, we were talking about about parents, right? And and about um, just sort of like your growth of Mackenzie as a woman who experiences autism. And as you've gotten older, you said a lot of your behaviors have changed, your tools have changed, you have more more tools available to you now emotionally, socially than you did when you were younger. Um, at what point do you feel like it's time for you, like you're 23, so you're still a young adult, but at what point... Do you feel like it was necessary for you to start making some of your own decisions? And did you have to ask your parents for space or did they kind of push you out of the nest? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I believe my mom was the one that was like, you know, she's the type of person that, yeah, you need. Yeah, I'm always going to be here for you. I'm going to give you these tools and I want you to take it and fly with them. She's the type of person that, you know, she take take she she did it by years. Um and I think uh, maybe like 2 or 3 years ago it was like started I was starting to see what she was doing and I was kind of scared about it cuz you never want to leave your parents, you know, <laughs> cuz mm -hmm. they're, they're your people but um after you know this i guess for me i want to go because i know she'll be okay i know i will be okay because i have my support people um and i know she's gonna be okay because she has herself and her friends and you know and yeah and family that can help her out when I'm gone because she's a, she's an older m parent Ooh, I'm just oh. picturing uh -oh. her getting mad right <laughs> now <laughs> no 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 I'm not trying to be like her, like she's older or anything but she's 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 getting up there in age I guess <laughs> you're not making it better <laughs> I know I feel like I'm just <laughs> she's older than you she's yes. a grown-ass woman is <laughs> she's, what she is she's grown. <laughs> um you don't want to mess with her either. That's she is scary. Um, <laughs> but um, I feel like all of the supports that I have, I'm able to live on my own. I am living on my own. Um, but my mom is like five steps away from me. So it's Tell still, us about that situation. It's still. Um, <laughs> um, so my mom bought a house two years ago. Or this is going to be three years, I think. Um she bought a house that has a carriage house in the back. Um, her house is super small, so I want to hold both of us. And so she got a carriage house in the back. So I live in the carriage house in the back. It has a kitchen, a dining room, a living room, a bedroom, and a bathroom. Um, so if I need it, needed her or need her, she can just come over and help me out. Um but I'm to that age, I was like, I don't want my mom in my house. I was like, I mm. need to get a little bit more farther away. Um, and my plan is to move eventually a little bit farther away so I can, you know, spread my wings and fly a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm flying a little bit now, but I want to fly a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, my um, And I'm driving now, too, so I don't have to rely on people that's right you just, you just took your driving test right 
I did. Um, I have my driver's permit. That's the other thing. Anybody could drive. If you have a disability, you can drive. If you have one leg, you can drive. You, mm-hmm. Anything, you can drive. So mm-hmm. it's not like you always have to take public transportation. Um, I started out taking public transportation, and it was it's fun and scary and a little bit, you know, uncomfortable because you see all different types of people on the bus. Um and I just feel like this year's gonna be super good because I'm I'm starting to see where I want to be and stuff. So nice. And has your relationship with your parents and with your mom in particular changed since you got your own some some of your own space? Yes. Um, I feel like me and my mom are super close because like middle school high school and elementary school i feel like we would be fighting like all the time um because i couldn't understand what she wanted and she didn't understand what i wanted at some times um so that would be like really big fights that um would have to i would have to go to a treatment center for like um a weekend just so she could get a break so it was like a respite thing for her but a strict not positive place for me to Mm. um learn that the the wrong thing is you can't hit you can't spit you can't do anything so well do anything bad um so um i feel like that really helped me to find my grasp i didn't like excelsior youth center at all um, it was an all girls treatment. It was pretty rough, um, mm-hmm. and I, it was just really scary for me. To, and I finally just opened my eyes one day. I was like, I need to stop being so rude and mean and violent to my mom because she's the only person I have. Mm-hmm. So I feel. So just to clarify, if if you're willing, I'm. So Excelsior Youth Center was a place that you're saying when you and your mom would have these kind of mega blowouts mm-hmm. that then she would need a break and 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 you would be in a place where you said violent, rude, some of those things. And so the facility that you went to was to try and help you calm down and calm down and behavior. manage your behaviors. OK. And it would give her a chance to also kind of calm down, down and, and manage her behavior right right <laughs> but the difference was she was at home doing it yeah. on her own and you were in a facility yeah okay um what about the other people that you met in there did you feel an affinity meaning did you feel connected to the other girls and young women that you met um, in those facilities actually no i didn't feel comfortable there at the time i didn't know what sexuality was at the time so they would always ask if i was a stud or like what are you um and they would try to you know Mm. date and i didn't know any of that word any of those words until like a couple weeks ago um but um i never felt felt safe in that facility Mm -hmm. um but the staff there was really helpful and i still have contact with them so um, just seeing where I am now and where I was, I was like, I can't believe I was that type of person mm. that needed help, help, like. And so you're help. saying that from that experience that, that there was a point where it kind of helped you with a breakthrough mm-hmm. of like, I don't want to be here anymore, yeah. which means I got to change my yeah. behavior. And so I stopped and I, now I don't really, if I get to that point of fighting with my mom, I, t- I can just go to my house or get the go space. somewhere else that she's not around i don't need to see her i don't need to hear her i'm at my place and she doesn't need to see me she doesn't need to hear me i can just she can go to her house Mm -hmm. i want to bring faith in on this a little bit because faith when did you move out of your parents house and into your own apartment Um, how long has it been now the only thing i know i've just been at my house for a long time but I do you think more than a couple years? I think so. Okay. Um, it was sometime in July, so of last year. I don't think it was last year. I think it was like way before that. I think. Okay, it was, but you moved in 
in July one year. Right. And, and so when my family came out from Chicago. Um, your extended family? Like your aunts and uncles and stuff? Yes. Okay. Um, so like everybody was in town um, and I was just. I was just telling them I, I was going to move out, and they were so happy, and I told them where I'm going to live, and they were just so happy for me, and so they just told me how proud they were. Great. But for for my parents, it was hard at first being the empty nest for them, but by now... um. But now it got a lot easier. And before you moved out, Faith, were you feeling ready to get out of there? Like, were you feeling like, <laughs> I want to move out, I want to move out, let me out? Yes, I, I did feel that way. Um, and were your, was your family worried about you living on your own? Were there concerns about that? or? Well, no, I, I just remember I told my parents, like, I wanted to move out. And is that okay? And they were saying, of course, you can always move out and get your own place. We're very happy for you. We're proud of you. So I think I'll be fine. But there are real considerations like how are we going to pay for it? And mm -hmm. well, you know, yeah. how are you going to stay safe? And so what are some of the things, Faith, that for you, and we've talked about this on the show a little bit before, but what are some of the things that you had to do in order to make living independently work? Well, I I actually know my responsibilities are um, definitely being safe. Um, and it's because they taught me to be safe and to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I already knew that. Mm -hmm. um, but I just felt ready to move out and just be on my own. So you were willing to do the work to make it, to yeah. Make it happen? Yeah, I, I did. And what about you, Mackenzie? Like where there's, did you feel like you had to learn about? Oh, I am still learning. Um, <laughs> I'm not ready to move out, but I want to move out. I, Meaning I know like off the property. Even. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I need to work on like, you know, doing my dishes or, you know, doing my own laundry, not having my mom say, you need to do your laundry. Mm. Um, just stuff like that. Um. I still need to work on that a little bit. Raise uh, your hand if, <laughs> if you also need to work on that. <laughs> um, I procrastinate a lot um, with household stuff. Um, and, yeah. And, like, I have to take medicine, so I sometimes I need reminders to take my pills, too. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what my mom is working on right now is, you know, not really reminding me, but if I skip some meds or something, she gets on me about yeah. that. But yeah, so it's a process. It sounds mm -hmm. like well, for both of you. Well, yeah, like for me, it's like I don't, I don't really need. I know your mom needs to help you sometimes, and that's okay. Um, but for me, I don't need help. You know, like I, like I know I need to clean my house. I know I need to do laundry. Well, maybe you just need different kinds of help. Is that accurate? Because, like, what about with your sisters? They help you in different ways. Well, yeah, but it's, like, like different ways is, like, helping me to cook, you know? Yeah. And I like to cook, and it's fun. And so my younger sister is helping me to cook, and that's fun. You know, just cooking with my sister is always the fun part. And my other sister, she usually helps me with buying clothes or um or getting new glasses or something mm -hmm. um so something like that um and that's always okay but the other kind of help i don't need is like packing or anything else you know and you feel like sometimes people are trying to give you help you don't need yeah you know like yeah. i've been talking to my sisters and saying i don't need help so so they're they're still learning about where yeah where they're to stop. learning about yeah. that you know but i'm giving some ideas for them to help me with and it's okay yeah and mackenzie can you relate to that are there areas where people try to help you that you're like back up <laughs> <laughs> yeah um 
like, I don't have a scenario, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, with people just overstepping and mm-hmm. stuff. I get really mad when people do that to me, so um, I just can't think of a scenario right now. Yeah. Um, But I know what you mean. Yeah. Like, well, can I ask, like, overstepping is, like, overstepping, like, like your mom is trying to tell you, like, don't go, don't go out when it's dark out to get something and you want to be safe. Not really. I mean, like, I guess it was, like, more in, like, school or um, Special Olympics type of situation, like, teaching me how to dribble a ball. And I already know how to. Uh-huh. do that that type of stuff like what are you you not you can't see me dribbling a ball right now so feel condescending yeah yeah that I'm somebody's doing treating you like you're a kid and then yeah. you're like i've already <laughs> believe <laughs> been me that, i've been that. yeah i've been doing that yeah. um well that's that's cool i want to pivot and change a little bit i want to ask you about language um so in and I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole because we can really, you know, language is something that we all have a lot of opinions about. But in particular with autism, I know some people identify as being a person with autism or a person experiencing autism and other people might identify as an autistic woman. And I'm curious for you, do you have a preference about Um, language? I say autism. I don't like the word autistic for some reason. It just feels like it's putting you on the spot. Mm. Because um, there are all different types of autism, I feel like. So it's like some people are nonverbal. Some people have a learning disability with autism. And for my autism, I have a learning disability. So I have trouble reading, writing, math, and all of that stuff. And, you know, um, so I just feel like autism or autistic is this putting you as one thing, I guess. I don't know. Or the opposite. Well, and usually, I mean, what I do is I just, I, I listen to how people talk about themselves mm-hmm. and then I just do that. Um, when, when someone says they're autistic, that's called identity first language, yeah. right? And when someone says they're a person with autism, that's called person first language. You put the person first mm-hmm. or you put the identifier first. Um, and I'm just always like, it's easiest if we let people just choose for themselves, yeah. right? And then Not always. And so that's why I was curious because I know that some people with autism do like the word autistic. And I was just, I had never heard you use it, but I was curious if you ever thought about it. But um, yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or I just say, I have autism or I have a learning disability. That's. Gotcha. So, main thing. I'm sorry, um, okay. but can I ask, what kind of learning disability do you have? Um, so, I have trouble with reading, writing, math, all of the education stuff. Because that's, okay, <laughs> um, the reason I, I ask because my uncle has a learning disability as well, because um, I think he had a hard time understanding um, because he's saying crazy words sometimes, like he he doesn't know what to do, um, and he's and he died from a brain tumor. So I'm I'm so I'm I'm learning about your disability, and it's really interesting. And it sounds of like him. well, and there may be some similarities there in terms of like how differences in our brains and our bodies affect our behavior. Um, But it also sounds like there's some good differences there too, because like having a brain tumor is, um, is also really different than autism in a lot of ways. Um, But having a learning disability or just, you know, having trouble with reading or writing or math or, you know, um, that's something that they might have in common. Yeah. Let's say, let's get, let's move to our final question for Mackenzie. Okay. Uh huh. Drum roll, please. <laughs> it's very echoey. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. Uh, Mackenzie, we are curious, what do you think is your special gift? Um, I, my special gift is, I think, I, I'm like the glue that puts everybody together. Sometimes I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, like, 
if I'm not in the picture for a long time, they just kind of spread out. Mm. Um, so I feel like I'm like the one that keeps them together sometimes. Um, and I love photography. That's probably my other special gift is photography as well. Yeah, you got the eye. Because this girl right here. She's pointing at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Why do you you really think that that is because... Go ahead, tell the story. Um, So Andrea did a photography class with Dylan's Down with the Arts. Yeah, there's a local organization yeah. that we really love called Dylan's Down with the Arts. And they... And so they I had think me come I in was do a workshop. Ooh, I think I was like, I would say nine or ten. maybe like eleven. I mean, I feel like I was younger though. I don't know, girl. I I don't know. It's been I was a living long time. back here, so it, was, it yeah. was probably at least it was probably ten. It was probably at least ten or eleven years ago. So you would have probably been like eleven, maybe twelve. 10? I mean, that's I still young. <laughs> that's I don't still young. know. I think I was like in the. Well, anyway, sure, anywho, um, she did this photography class at this park, and I believe that you brought cameras or I think that they they provided or the they cameras, yeah. provided the cameras, and we did like a little photo shoot little thing at this park and a petting farm animal situation, <laughs> um, and ever since that, I just loved photography. It's cool because you never know when when uh, you're going to do something that's kind of random, like just mm -hmm. a single workshop or a day program or, you know, whatever small, a small action, a small activity, right, that can really impact us and change the way that we pursue things. Because mm -hmm. now it's all you now. I mean, that was like two and a half hours one <laughs> afternoon. And now you're you've been doing photography and you have your own portrait business. I do. So if you need photos. Uh, can people contact you? If, yeah. So contact reach out to the Wayfaring or... Band and then we'll connect you with Mackenzie and with her photography skills. But she's available to shoot portraits and other types Family, of families. Family, seniors, weddings. Nice. Uh, my my um, special one is uh, shooting uh, senior pictures for special ed. Nice. And that's a really important one. I think a lot of parents who have young kind of teenagers who experience disabilities struggle with this idea of like, Oh, like, can we do the photos the way that all their siblings have had their photo mm -hmm. taken? Or like maybe the photographer doesn't really know how to work with somebody um, and who may, who may have a disability. And so if, if you've been wondering about that, then reach out to us at info at the wayfaring band.com and then we'll connect you with Mackenzie and, and she can help you out. Uh, Mac, do you have any questions for us? <laughs> She's shaking her head. <laughs> no. There's nothing you're wondering? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Well, then we'll wrap it up for today. But thank you so much thank for being so on much the show. Thank you for having me. Faith and I really, we were excited that you were coming in. And uh, thanks for everything that you've shared. We've covered a lot of ground and we appreciate you. Me too. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we will talk to you soon. See ya. Ta-da. Everybody In is sound engineered by Karen Hibner with original music by The Dosage. It is produced by The Wayfaring Band, a Denver-based 501c3 nonprofit specializing in life skills and leadership training through travel for adults with and without disabilities. Be sure to rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Ta-ta for now. Ta-ta for now.